and as a kid. Thank you. <coughs> Smoking mirrors. You're all ready. <laughs> oh my. Thank you all for your patience. Does it work? Is You're it ready. there? Yeah. Okay. When the 150th committee initially envisioned these presentations for the congregation, when the yes, <laughs> yes, we can hear. When the 150th committee initially envisioned these presentations for the congregation, we were hoping to have someone from the historical society come and share a presentation on Port Townsend history. But staffing changes on their side left us without that opportunity. So as I set out to research on the home front for my presentation, I struggled with the definition of the phrase on the home front, which was first used in 1917 during World War I to describe the full participation of the British public who were suffering from the Zeppelin raids and enduring food rationing. The dictionary officially defines the home front as a noun describing the civilian population and activities of a nation whose armed forces are engaged in war abroad. But we have war here too sometimes. Because we'd not had the history presented by the Historical Society, I decided I wanted to look at our home front in more of a timeline historically so that we might better imagine and experience the community that was Port Townsend and what that might have looked like during the time of conflict, both locally and abroad. I hope this might give us the opportunity to imagine something of the lives of the folks who might have served in our church or been served by our church community during our history. In order to do this and to weave things together, I need to go back to time before Port Townsend existed. By the late 1700s, Russia, Spain, and British navigators were all exploring the area we now call the Pacific Northwest. And soon after the Revolutionary War, the United States joined in the competition. European and American explorers claimed areas that they discovered for their governments, despite the obvi obvious fact that the Northwest was already populated by diverse indigenous people. By the early 1800s, neither Spain nor Russia were pursuing claims to the region between the northern border of California, the 42nd parallel, and the southern extension of Russian America, now known as Alaska. This left the United States and Britain to contend, along with the region's existing inhabitants, for the vast area known as the Oregon Country, which was all the territory west of the Rocky Mountains between California and Alaska. In 1818, the two countries agreed on the Treaty of Joint Occupation of Oregon, which provided for peaceful occupation by citizens of both nations while postponing a final division of the region. Despite America's claims and early explorations at the time of the Joint Occupation Treaty and for the several, next several decades, the only uh, significant non-indigenous presence in the Oregon country was British in the form of Hudson's Bay Company. Although it eventually established some large-scale company farms, the Hudson's Bay Company's goal was to trade, not to settle. It encouraged good relations with indigenous people who were valuable fur trading partners and discovered and discouraged independent settlement. Americans, in contrast, saw the vast Oregon country as a land to be settled. Although few Americans had yet ventured north of the Columbia River at that time, expansionist politicians demanded that the British cede the entire Oregon country to the United States. The two countries managed to solve their differences peacefully. <coughs> um, sorry. In 1846, in the 1846 Treaty of Oregon, which divided the mainland Oregon country in, at the 49th parallel, and granted all of Vancouver Island, which extends south of the 49th parallel, to Britain. The treaty resolved most of the differences, but it didn't take in, it make clear which country would get the San Juan Islands, which lie south of the 49th parallel between Vancouver Island and the mainland. The ambiguous language 
allowed each side to assume that the San Juan Islands were rightfully theirs. Port Tanzan was the first permanent American settlement on the peninsula. The first white settlers, Alfred Plummer and Charles Batchelor, arrived in 1851 and were brought to shore by the same Captain Fowler who sold us the land that our church was originally built on. They built a log cabin in 1951 at what is now the corner of Water and Tyler Streets. By May of 1852, I said 19, didn't I? A, uh, May of 1852, the total recorded population of Port Townsend consists of three white families and 15 white bachelors. <laughs> also in 1852, Jefferson County was established as a part of the Oregon Territory. <clears throat> and by 1853, 20 years before our original stone church was envisioned, Washington became a territory. Meanwhile, for eight years after the Treaty of Oregon was ratified, neither the United States government or Great Britain made any move to use or occupy the islands that each claimed. Eventually, in 1854, Great Britain's Hudson Bay's company set up a successful salmon curing and sheep ranching operation on San Juan Island. A man named Charles John Griffin was the company agent appointed to manage the new farm. The sweeping views inspired him to name the operation Bellevue Farm. Along with the sheep, Griffin brought crop seed and farm animals, including some Berkshire boars. Because of its position near the entrance of the Sound, Port Townsend in 1854 became Puget Sound's customs point of entry. It was a bustling port seemingly destined for greatness. Isaac Eby, the U.S. customs collector stationed at Port Townsend, made several trips across the Strait of Juan de Fuca to, de to demand that the Hudson Bay's company pay custom duties on the animals and other properties it had that it had, in Eby's view, smuggled into the U.S. territory. A series of verbal confrontations followed as Eby and his deputy threatened to seize the company's sheep for the uncollected duties, and Bellevue farm manager Griffin threatened to have them arrested, but none of those threats were carried out. In 1856, the U.S. military established Fort Townsend, which they built about four miles down the bay from Port Townsend near Chimicum Creek, which had been determined to be the nearest reliable source of good water. At that time, the barracks and facilities at Fort Townsend were built to meet an anticipated need for protection from the indigenous people who were living in the area. Back across the strait, American settlers first began appearing in the San Juan Islands between the summer of 1858 and early 1859. And I have to tell you, it was uncanny that his sermon this morning talked about cameras focusing, because I think you'll notice that I've taken a lot of stuff and made copies of it from the internet, and it's not all clear. So I apologize. <laughs> <clears throat> Most of the 20 or so settlers were frustrated miners who were seeking farm sites on the island after returning from a short-lived Fraser, Fraser River gold rush in British Columbia. Due to the circumstances at Fraser River, these frustrated miners despised Governor James Douglas, who happened to be the royal governor and the British authority at that time on the San Juan Island. The governor had angered Americans in the Fraser gold fields by strictly enforcing British law which, unlike American law, precluded individual mining claims. They charged miners a monthly fee and excluded American merchants and ship owners from operating in British territory. British landowner Charles Griffin and Governor Douglas feared that Bellevue Farm and the entire island would soon be, soon be overrun by those American squatters. Douglas complained to the British Foreign Ministry and was authorized to warn off the settlers and to maintain British civil power on the island. Of course, the American settlers had no intention of recognizing British civil authority on the island that they considered to be part of America. Finally, in June of 1859, 
the boundary dispute started to cause trouble, and it was all set off by a pig. <laughs> Lyman Cutler, one of the former gold miners, had arrived on the island in April of 1859, intending to claim a 160-acre homestead. The crude farm headquarters that he scratched out a mile or so north of the Bellevue farm occupied far less ground and his small garden was not fully fenced. One of Griffin's Berkshire boars from the Bellevue farm took to rooting in Cutler's unprotected potato patch. Returning, despite his efforts to drive it away and despite his complaints to the Hudson Bay's company employees. When the boar returned again, June 15, 1859, Cutler, goaded by the laughter of the company herdsmen watching the boar rooting in his potatoes, shot the pig. It turned out that the pig belonged to the Hudson's Bay Company British employee Charles Griffin, who became angry and reported Cutler's crimes to the British authorities, who threatened to arrest him. Other Americans rallied around Cutler and devised a petition to bring in U.S. military protection for him. <laughs> General William S. Harney, a commander of the Department of Oregon with strong anti-British bias, received the petition and dispatched Captain George Pickett of the 9th Infantry, Infantry Regiment and 66 American soldiers based at Fort Townsend to San Juan Island for Cutler's protection. The British, not taking so kindly to this show of aggression, retaliated by sending three warships to the area. <laughs> the result was a brief standoff with both sides adding more firepower to their side until there were at least five British warships and over 400 American soldiers with cannons stationed at the ready. This is about a pig. Once officials in both London and Washington heard about the conflict, they stepped in to intervene. To quickly de-escalate the situation, they limited the number of residents on San Juan Island to 100 people on both sides. The top half, oops, that's the ship, <laughs> the warship. The top half they gave to the British and the southern half to the Americans until a formal agreement regarding sovereignty could be reached. Okay. In 1860, Port Townsend, with a population of 264 non-Indigenous people, officially became the fourth largest city in the state of Washington. The bloody civil war and its aftermath preoccupied the nation during much of the 1860s. And although it was remote from the battlefields, the march of progress in Washington territory slowed. All regular troops were withdrawn from Fort Townsend in 1861, and volunteers garrisoned the post at Fort Townsend for the next few years. General Thomas, in his annual report for 1869, recommended that the land and the buildings of Fort Townsend Post be disposed of because they were not in the proper place for defense purposes. However, the next year, General E.R. Canby took the opposite view of the situation and recommended that the post be retained, although there was no immediate need for troops there. He gave his reasons for desiring the post retained that it was near the frontier on a very good harbor and troops stationed there would be an easy reach of the whole Puget Sound. <coughs> Boundary negotiations pro progressed slowly on San Juan Island. Finally, in the Treaty of Washington signed on May 8, 1871, the countries agreed to arbitration and a ruling was issued on October 21, 1872. After 54 years of joint occupation with Britain dating from the 1818 treaty, the San Juan Islands were exclusively American territory. The island is still commemorated as the place where America and the United Kingdom almost resorted to full-fledged war over the death of a pig. One year later, in 1873, the land for the Presbyterian Church was purchased from Captain E.S. Fowler for $250 in gold coin, and shortly thereafter, building was begun. 
And I say, I was interested to learn that back in 1855, the same Captain Fowler was instrumental in transporting negotiators by ship all around the region to convince the indigenous people to trust the whites and affix their X mark to the point no point treaty. By 1875, there were 66 port towns and businesses listed in a regional directory. This is Water Street in 1875. Wow. By the 1880s, Port Townsend was a booming seaport and it was Washington's port of entry. Great efforts were made to connect the city with the nation's expanding railway systems. Local businessmen and citizens invested their fortunes hoping to entice rail companies to choose Port Townsend for their terminal. They believed the city's future rode on the rails. <coughs> In 1874, Company C of the 21st Infantry, con uh, commanded by Captain George Burton, who had been stationed at American Camp San Juan, was transferred to Fort Townsend, where it remained until 1876. General William Tecumseh Sherman again thought the fort too far away from town, and he remarked in 1877 that he regarded Fort Townsend as an obsolete establishment. Instead of the garrison protecting Port Townsend, the town is guarding Fort Townsend. It was recommended again in 1888 that Fort Townsend be abandoned because of its small size and poor location. It was thought that a new fort of large proportions might be constructed closer to Port Townsend. In 1894, General Otis had taken command of the Department of the Columbia, which incorporated the Puget Sound Territory, and he took the stance that as Fort Townsend remains in operation and is garrisoned by a single company of infantry, the only advantage to be de derived from its retention consists in the fact that it furnishes shelter for the troops. It might as well not exist. By 1889, sorry, um, shortly after he made his report, the barracks at Fort Townsend were destroyed by fire and Fort Townsend was closed. The 640 acres of Fort Townsend were then turned over to the Department of the Interior on June 28, 1895. By, 18, nine, by 1889, Congregation of First Presbyterian Church had outgrown our old stone church and a beautiful new building took its place. This was also the year that Washington gained official statehood. In 1891, the Military Board of Artillery Officers urged that attention be paid to the lack of proper defense for Puget Sound, which in fact was becoming a very important region due to its rapid growth, its foreign, large foreign trade, and because it was to be the terminus of several transcontinental railroads. As the non-seafaring population increased, Port Townsend reached a tentative agreement with the Oregon Improvement Company a subsidiary of the Union Pacific Railroad, to route its line from the Columbia River to Port Townsend. The speculation, speculation boom was on, and population quickly doubled in anticipation of a golden future. Property values skyrocketed, and businesses flourished. Whoops, wrong button. I was interested to find part of an essay written by John Muir in 1889 that talked about Port Townsend at this time. He said, the upper story of Port Townsend is charmingly located, wide bright waters on one side, flowing evergreen woods on the other. The streets are well laid out and well tended and the houses with their luxuriant gardens about them have an air of taste and refinement seldom found in towns on the edge of a wild forest. The people seem to have come here to make true homes, attracted by the beauty and fresh, breezy healthfulness of the place, as well as by business advantages, trusting to natural growth and advancement instead of restless, booming methods. They perhaps have caught some of the spirit of calm moderation and enjoyment from their English neighbors across the water in Victoria. Of late, however, this sober tranquility has begun to give way some whiffs of the whirlwind of real estate speculation up the sound 
having at length touched the town and ruffled the surface of its calmness, end quote. The first attempt at a railroad connection ended with only one mile of track. The second made it as far as Quilcene, 27 miles. Hopes were dashed when Portland and Tacoma were named the trans transcontinental line terminals. The rail line did not did make it from Port Townsend to Quilcene, and it did run for nearly 100 years into the 18, 1980s, but always at a financial loss. The railroad's claim to fame was that it is said to have changed ownership more than any other railroad in the entire country. <laughs> In 1893, the nation was led into an economic crisis that became the worst depression in U.S. history to, at that time. Railroad and industrial stocks plummeted and several major companies went bankrupt. The panic of 1893 saw Port Townsend population plummet from 9,000 to barely 2,000. Port Townsend Bay became a graveyard of abandoned boats and Port Townsend would never again be counted as one of the 10 most populous cities in the state. It fell into a deep and prolonged decline. Three years later, in, the, in June of 1896, the Secretary of War was authorized by Congress to fortify three points on the coast of Washington to be called Fort Warden, Fort Casey, and Fort Flagler for the protection of Puget Sound. The Admiralty Inlet was considered so strategic to the defense of Puget Sound at the turn of a century that these three forts were built at the entrance with huge guns, creating a triangle of fire that could theor theoretically thwart any invasion attempted by sea. The cost of construction and armament of the Puget Sound defenses was estimated at seven million, a boon to the sev severely depressed economies of Jefferson County and Port Townsend still suffering from the effects of the panic of 1893. Maristone Island was the first developed. <clears throat> this had not been done without foresight. In 1866, a number of years earlier, by executive order, a section of 640 acres of land had been reserved for military purposes. In late 1896, after receiving the orders to fortify the Puget Sound, the Army Corps of Engineers surveyed the Maristone site for the fortification, and in 1897, the government purchased more land from individual landowners to build additional gun emplacements. Building the defense fortifications proceeded slowly until the Spanish-American War of 1898. There was no actual construction work done until after the battleship USS Marine, Maine blew up and sank in Havana Harbor on February 16, 1898, with the loss of 252 officers and men. Then the work on a fort was accelerated to protect the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, which had been built in 1891 from potential threats from the Spanish fleet. Fort Flagler was occupied by Battery B, 3rd Co Coastal Artillery, prior to completion and was designated as the temporary headquarters of the Harbor Defense Command of Puget Sound. The detachment consisted of three officers and 86 enlisted men who lived in a tent encampment while they trained and worked alongside local laborers. Construction materials for all three forts were purchased largely from local sources. Lumber came from the mills in Port Townsend, Port Hadlock, and Port Gamble. Sand and gravel came from the nearby pits. Construction of 12 buildings, including offices, mess hall, and barracks, was completed in June of 1899. Named in, the honor, in honor of Brigadier General Daniel Webster Flagler, Fort Flagler was the first to be officially activated on July 27, 1899. When completed, Fort Flagler had 26 artillery pieces overlooking Admiralty Inlet. I was surprised at how much bigger it was than I had thought that it was. <clears throat> In Port Townsend, construction work on fortifications of the land above the Point Wilson Lighthouse had been delayed until 1887. And this is, this is from that time, this uh, slide. <clears throat> 
of the lighthouse. It had been delayed because the property where the fort had been envisioned was privately owned, and the government had to clear title to the land through condemnation proceedings. But when co construction was started, the Army Corps of Engineers took charge of building the construction dock, the warehouses, and a tramway to haul concrete for the gun emplacements from the dock to the mis mixing plant. To meet construction needs, the Army laid a pipeline from Port Townsend and pumped water into large storage tanks inside the fort. It took 200 men almost three years to complete the excavation and concrete work for the gun emplacements. Named in honor of Admiral John Lorimer Warden, captain of the ironclad vessel USS Monitor, Fort Warden was activated in 1902. The 126th Coast Artillery Company, consisting of 87 soldiers, was the first detachment assigned to Fort Warden. They arrived from Seattle on board the steamer SS Majestic in May of 1902 and were quartered pending the completion of the barracks. 23 permanent building, buildings were under construction. A, a communication system connecting the three forts by cable was installed in 1903, and a powerhouse was built to supply electricity to the fort at the cost of $60,000. In September of 1904, headquarters of the Harbor Defense Command of Puget Sound was transferred from Fort Flagler to Fort Warden. Once work on the main batteries and Army Post had been completed, more troops were assigned there, along with the 6th Artillery Band, which must have been quite a fun experience for the community of Port Townsend. By the fall of 1905, Fort Warden was fully staffed with four coast artillery companies and the harbor defense system costing approximately 7.5 million was considered complete and operational, but still with self-generated electricity. Finally, in 1907, electric power made it out to Fort Warden. The addition of the two active forts was a modest boost to help Port Townsend's population to increase between 1900 and 1910, but in reality, barely 700 people were added to our count. On April uh, 6th, 1917, World War I was declared and the complement at Fort Warden was greatly expanded as soldiers arrived for training prior to being sent to European battlefields. To keep up with the demand, construction of new barracks and buildings continued throughout the war. This is Fort Warden. America's involvement in 1917 demanded artillery and 16 of Fort Warden's 41 artillery pieces were shipped to battlefields across Europe. At the onset of the Great War, the U.S. Depart War Department ordered the Harbor Defense Command to build seven regiments to be sent to France to fight under General John Pershing. Two of the units, the 48th and 49th Artillery Regiments, were made up of 1,400 non-commissioned officers and enlisted men some of whom came from Forts Flagler and Fort Warden. During World War I, Fort Flagler was also used by the U.S. Army as a training center for soldiers. Twelve of Flagler's artillery pieces were removed and sent to Europe, where they were converted into field or railway artillery. I found a few happenings in the greater Port Townsend area during World War I. There were parades in town, and I'm sure there were church members observing or participating. There was a Red Cross picnic at Seal Rock near Quilcene, where I imagine some church members might have attended. The participants who were hosting the picnic had devised a way to stop people as they attempted to drive in by a rope stretched across the road and required a toll to be collected as a donation to the American Red Cross. <laughs> of course, no one refused. And there was also a group of boys from Port Townsend who'd been invited to the fort to work out as a drill team. Maybe some of them attended our church youth group. Something else that could have been happening in Port Townsend during that time was the Spanish flu of 1918. 
The pathogen's place of origin is still bit debated, but the role of World War I in its rapid spread is undisputed. Even so, Washington State, despite a heav heavy military presence, fared better than any other state in the Union except for, Un for Oregon. While the death toll was highest in our most populous cities, the pandemic touched nearly every community. Attempts to control the outbreak were largely futile, and from September 1918 through the end of that year, it killed nearly 5,000 Washingtonians. More than half of the victims were between the ages of 20 and 49. The misplaced Spanish flu pandemic in late 1918, the misplaced, misnamed Spanish flu pandemic peaked in the late 1918 and re remained the most widespread and lethal outbreak of disease to afflict humankind worldwide, that is, until the COVID-19 pandemic. In September of 2021, it was announced that COVID-19 had killed more Americans than the Spanish flu, 681,000 versus approximately 675,000. However, the U.S. population is now three times greater than it was in 1918, mm -hmm. and in percentage terms, the Sp Spanish flu was considerably more lethal. This is a group of police officers in Seattle. I wanted to show you that some fashion does come back around. <laughs> <laughs> World War I was an interesting time for Presbyterians and for PCUSA as a whole. <clears throat> President Woodrow Wilson was an outspoken Presbyterian, and in response to the American public who had elected him, Wilson thought it was important to retain neutrality because almost one out of every seven Americans had been born in one of the warring countries. Wilson said, neutrality is a negative word. It does not express what America ought to feel. We are not trying to keep out of trouble. We're trying to preserve the foundations on which peace may be rebuilt. However, in 1917, America was forced to become involved after continued German submarine attacks, and Wilson ultimately offered assistance to the Allied forces. The General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in the United States, during its sessions in May of 1917, took steps to include its ministers and other church workers in a massive mobilization for war. Shall Chaos Triumph was one of the many posters issued during World War I to encourage support of the war. The poster was created to encourage people to give to the Victory Fund campaign, a war bond campaign that would help to finance the Allied victory. The text, Shall Chaos Triumph, encouraged people to give as much as possible to advance the military campaign. Many propaganda posters, including Christian symbolism to encourage Americans to help fund the war, to help fund the war, period. <laughs> PCUSA also published a book to be distributed to enlisted soldiers and sailors. The opening paragraph of the little book's preface comments that the recent General Assembly meeting had, quote, placed the entire resources of the church at the disposal of the government in carrying on the present war. The publisher left out a few key words at the end of that statement, which were, as in its judgment may be wise or needful. But that wasn't in the book. So even though the intention of the booklet was good, the version published in the booklet implies that the church is an unlimited servant to the government. Oops. <laughs> Following the war, the Puget Sound Defense Network was greatly reduced for the two active forts in our area. A World War I high of 4,500 troops for the Puget Sound gun batteries was reduced to 50 officers and 884 enlisted men. The 102 Puget Sound guns now numbered 66. While they shrunk, Puget Sound's defenses were not eliminated. Command functions became centralized at Fort Warden, and Fort Flagler was used as a training camp for the Army Reserve Officer Training Corp and the Washington National Guard. The development of balloons and aircraft came to represent the majority of Puget Sound's coast, seacoast defense 
greatly diminishing the importance of the coast artillery. May 11, 1920, the 24th Bloon Company arrived at Fort Warden and carried out test flights. In 1921, a balloon hangar was built at Fort Warden. The balloon company's stay was brief, as it soon discovered that wind conditions were not conducive to balloon flight. <clears throat> None of Europe's political drama of the early 1920s seemed to affect the United States or its Pacific coastline. And by 1921, Fort Flagler was placed on caretaker status. Fort Warden remained active and in 1922 was selected as one of three National Guard training camps for guardsmen from Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. The morning of December 7th, 1941 propelled America into war and the defense of the western coastline became a priority. The Western Defense Command closed off the Pacific coast, anxious for possible naval or air attacks from Axis powers. Watchtowers, searchlights, barbed wire barricades were constructed on the beaches. Observation posts were manned for aerial intelligence. Machine gun pits and foxholes were dug and patrols were organized for beach and land defense. Construction began on temporary buildings to house the influx of soldiers brought to Fort Warden for training. Anti-motor torpedo boat defenses utilizing <coughs> anti-motor torpedo boat defenses were installed at the fort as well as at Point Hudson in Port Townsend. Directly following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Navy was charged with the installation of underwater surveillance facilities as well as the identification of any vessels present in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. These new responsibilities led to the creation of the Joint Harbor Entrance Control Post and Harbor Defense Command Post at Fort Warden, which was manned 24 hours a day. These water operations were a concerted effort between the Army and Navy. The Japanese submarine attack on the United States mainland 200 miles south of Fort Warden, along with the Japanese invasion of Alaska's Aleutian Islands that same month, prompted the U.S. military to place an even higher priority on seacoast defense. Batteries and buildings were quickly camouflaged. Dummy buildings and natural concealment techniques were employed. The troop numbers at Fort Warden increased drastically. Nearly 4,500 troops were stationed at Fort Warden by 1943, a stark contrast from the 600 men who had called the fort home just three years before in 1940. America was prepared, but fighting became concentrated in Europe and the Asian Pacific. The threat of a Pacific Northwest invasion had mostly passed. Fort Warden continued to train and house troops destined for battle overseas. In the community of Port Townsend, starting in the spring of 1942, all citizens were required to follow a rationing program that was established to set limits on the amount of gas, food, and clothing that consumers would purchase. Families were issued ration stamps that were used to buy their allotment of everything from meat, sugar, fat, butter, vegetables, and fruit to gas, tires, clothing, and fuel. Most rationing restrictions ended in August of 1945, except for... <laughs> which lasted until 1947 in some parts of the country. Port Townsend and Jefferson County, along with most communities in the country, had locals heading off to fight the war. This is a display in the window of a Port Townsend drugstore that says these are residents of Port Townsend fighting in World War II. And another notice that was titled, Boys of Jefferson County Bound for World War II. There might have been some overlap on these two notices. I'm sure some of these were attached to First Presbyterian in some way. The end of World War II also marked the end of major military activity at Fort Warden. The pieces of artillery, uh, artillery be, were being removed in 1946. The only uptick of activity came in September of 1950 when a battalion of 400 arrived to begin training in response to North Korea's attack on their southern neighbor. Warden's coast artillery units were disbanded, the batteries dismantled, and the fort was relegated to an administrative unit on June 30th, 1953, 
when the Harbor Defense Command was deactivated. War Department Order No. 52 came over the line on June 22, 1955. Fort Warden, under the command <coughs> of the General of the Sixth Army, was decommissioned. After 53 years of operation, the fort perched on Point Wilson was officially closed with an angry shot never fired. As for our other Ring of Fire contingent, many of the buildings at Fort Flagler had been torn down in 1936 because of dry rot, but they were then rebuilt <coughs> during World War II and the Korean War when the Army used the fort for amphibious warfare, training, and maneuvers. Some of the gun emplacements were modified to accommodate, accommodate anti-aircraft games. Fort Flagler was officially deactivated on June 30th, 1953, ending 54 years of military jurisdiction. Although these military facilities did not lead to great prosperity for the city of Port Townsend, their construction and presence did provide a lifeline when it was most needed. Over the years, the fort's economic contributions varied with their state of activi activation. In threatening times and during war, troop levels increased and the local economy benefited. In peaceful times or times of government belt tightening, the forts were more lightly manned and nearby communities suffered. There were no replacement, they were no replacement for the boost that a railroad would have brought, but they helped keep Port Townsend alive when it had few other prospects. My final piece on the home front is about Indian Island, now called Naval Magazine Island. Archaeological evidence shows that Indian Island was an important location to the ancestors of the Sklalem and Chimicum people for over 1,500 years. In 1870, 15 years after the Point no, treat, no Point No Point Treaty, which moved indigenous people to the reservation set up by the government, Cheech Mahan, who had been a friend to the settlers in Port Townsend, met with a territorial delegate asking that the tribe, tribe be given Indian Island as the Sklalem Reservation, but that request was denied. Cheech Mahan and his family, including his two sons, Charlie Swan York and Prince of Wales, moved the existing, to the existing village at the northeast corner of Indian Island after having been forcibly removed to the Skakomish Reservation in Hood Canal from Port Townsend in 1871. Sklalem Indian Agency real estate records show that in 1887, a parcel of Indian Island land was sold by Catherine McCurdy to Prince of Wales and Charlie York, the sons of Chichmahan and to Chimicum Jim and his wife, Louise, whose descendants are citizens today of Port Gamble's Sklalem tribe. And that's this little tiny red dot. That's what she sold to them. In 1888, Prince of Wales purchased additional land on the island from Ms. McCurdy and maintained ownership and residency there until 1941. Indigenous owned lands on the island were lost when the federal government took it through the eminent domain process to convert the island into a naval base. The federal government purchased the land on Indian Island in 1939 and established Naval Magazine Indian Island and Net Depot on May 10, 1941, seven months before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. <coughs> During World War II, Indian Island's personnel worked around the clock to load Navy ships with munitions, assemble mines, and manufacture the giant anti-submarine nets that protected, protected Puget Sound waterways from penetration by enemy vessels. At the height of the war, more than 350 military personnel and 200 civilians worked on the island to load vessels seven days a week, sometimes loading two ships a day. When work levels dropped off after the end of the Korean War, the island was placed in a reduced operation status in 1959. After construction of the Trident submarine base at Bangor, the Navy's conventional musician storage and handling facilities mission shifted back to Indian Island with completion of a new ammunition wharf in <coughs> 1978. Today, approximately 170 civilian and military personnel work on the island every day. Naval Magazine Indian Island is the U.S. Navy's only
deep water ammunition port on the west coast with a pier that can support the largest navy and commercial vessels afloat. The installation is also one of the Department of Defense's largest ordnance storage sites on the west coast with magazines that store conventional musician, munitions, musicians, <laughs> ranging from small arms ammunition to aircraft ordnance to ship launched missiles. The installation's mission is to provide ordnance logistics support to the Navy, joint military services, and allied nations during times of peace and war. An average of 50 vessels stop at the island each year, including aircraft carriers, guided missile destroyers, guided missile submarines, ammo ships, U.S. Coast Guard patrol boats, military sea lift command vessels, and commercial barges and container ships. There are multiple sides to arguments regarding war and peace. I was married to a Quaker who became a Presbyterian. <laughs> he was a big man with a big voice, but he was a man of peace. He was a conscientious objector during uh, the Vietnam War, and particularly during the 60s, he was proud to march with others as they voiced their concerns about war. I know he was thankful to live in a country where it was possible to take a stand and to do so. I have been fascinated by the things I've learned about my hometown and our military and home front history through this process. And I appreciate having the opportunity to share what I learned with all of you. And so I conclude today with a hope for peace on our home front and in our world. yesterday after having lunch with Kathy and Elizabeth and sitting with my laptop on my lap and working on this. I'd been doing it for many days before that. And at 7 a.m. this morning, I looked up and the sun was coming up. Yes, I worked all night and I didn't get any sleep and I'm completely amazed that I'm still standing here. <laughs> Huh?